So make sure that your microphones are muted and no unnecessary movement or any third party. Otherwise, it will be included in the recording. So let's start. Asa kita nag-end, Dani? What topic? Ah, okay. Private. Private offenses, no? So we are now in complaint and information. So under the rules, a complaint is a sworn, sworn written statement charging a person with an offense subscribed by the offended party, any peace officer or other public officer charged with the enforcement of the law violated. On the other hand, an information is an accusation in writing Charging a person with an offense subscribed by the prosecutor and filed with the court. So, <clears throat> now let us distinguish between a complaint and an information. So, a complaint must be sworn, hence under oath. On the other hand, information does not require an oath. What is the reason? Because the prosecutor who subscribed the information is acting under the oath of his office. So therefore, it is no longer required. No? Oath is no longer required. Now, who will subscribe the complaint? Who may subscribe the complaint? It's either the offended party, any peace officer, or other public officer charged with the enforcement of the law violated. But with information, uh, it is the prosecutor who will subscribe the information. Now, let's talk about sufficiency of the complaint or information. So, a, a complaint or information is deemed sufficient if it contains no, or if, if it answers no, the following questions. Number one, who? The name of the accused, if committed by more than one, then all of them shall be included in the complaint. So, sino yung akusado? Kung sino-sino sila, kung marami sila. Second one is the name of the offended party. Second, the question what? The designation of the offense given by the statute. Second, the acts or omissions complained of as constituting the offense. Third, when? The approximate date of the commission of the offense. So when was the offense committed? Where? The place of the commission of the offense. So these are the info, uh, the contents, no? Uh, these are the, the uh, facts no, that should be included in the complaint or information. In order that the complaint or information uh, become uh, sufficient no, for the filing of a criminal case. So, what is the test for sufficiency? <clears throat> how, how will you know no, na sufficient na yung information or complaint? No? So that uh, pwede na mag-file of criminal case. The test is whether the crime is described in intelligible terms with such particularity as to apprise the accused with reasonable certainty of the offense charge because the purpose of the requirement for the information's validity and sufficiency is to enable the accused to suitably prepare for his defense since he is presumed to have no independent knowledge of the facts that constitute the offense. So uh, we will uh, relate this test no later in our discussion. So let's discuss the contents no one by one. So let's start with uh, the name of the accused. What is the rule?
So how will you state the name of the accused? No, under Section 7 of Rule 110, okay, establishes the following rules in designating the name of the accused. The complaint or information must state the name and surname of the accused or any... Uh, Okay, I'm back. Okay, you should state the name and the surname of the accused. So, yung pangalan o yung apelyedo. Or any affiliation or nickname by which he has been or is known. So, if you do not know the complete name of the accused, then pwede mong ilagay doon yung kanyang nickname or any affiliation no, by which he has been or is known. But if his name cannot be ascertained, he must be described under a fictitious name. So a description of the accused under a fictitious name must be accompanied by a statement that his true name is unknown. So if you do not know the full name of the accused and hindi mo rin alam kung ano yung nickname niya or affiliation niya, then you can um, use a fictitious name. For example, John Doe or Jane Doe. However, um, if you do that, no, you should include no, in the complaint a description no, of the accused no, under a fictitious name. And it must be accompanied by a statement that his true name is unknown. And later, if his true name is disclosed by him or becomes known in some other manner, his true name shall be inserted in the complaint or information and in the records of the case. Okay? So that is the rule for the name of the accused. What about the name of the offended party? So let us distinguish between a natural person and a juridical person. So if it is a natural person, so you should state the name and surname of the offended party. Or any appellation or nickname by which such person has been or is known. Okay. However, if there is no better way of identifying him, he must be described under a fictitious name. The same is true with the accused. No? You can write John Doe or Jane Doe, as the case may be. If later on the true name of the offended party is disclosed or ascertained, the court must cause such true name to be inserted. Now, what if the offended party is a juridical person? So, you should state its name or any name or designation by which it is known or by which it may be identified without need of averring that it is a juridical person or that it is organized in accordance with law. For example, um, ano example natin? ABC Corporation. So that's how you state no, the name of the juridical person. So what if the offended party the name of the offended party is unknown and the offense involves an offense against property. Okay? Um, if the name of the offended party is unknown, the property must be described with such particularity as to properly identify the offense charge. Okay? Next is Designation of the offense given by the statute. So, so what are the rules? The designation of the offense requires as a rule that the name given to the offense by statute must be stated in the complaint or information. Example, um, 
Article 315 of the Revised Penal Code or you may say ESTAFA. Ayan, ESTAFA under the Revised Penal Code. So that is, the desig that is how you designate no, the offense given by the statute. But if there is no designation of the offense, you may uh, reference, uh, may be made no, to the section or the subsection punishing it. Example, section 11, uh, uh, I am executing this affidavit to uh, support the filing of a criminal case against A uh, for violation of section 11 and 12 of Republic Act 9165. So that is an example no, of uh, citing the section or subsection of the law punishing uh, law punishing the person no, charge. When to be included in the complete de designation of the offense is the averment of the acts or omissions constituting the offense. So it is not enough that you will just uh, designate the offense given by the statute. You should state no, the acts or omissions complained of no, as constituting the offense. For example, in the crime of murder. So it is not enough that you designate the, the name of the crime which is murder no, in the complaint. You should state no, there or you, you should narrate no, the factual circumstances okay, leading to, to the conclusion that the crime committed is murder. So example, that we may say that on or about uh, September, uh, August 27, 2020, A went to the house of B, Anana, then, uh, and then after a heated discussion, a stab B. Uh, so, so you should narrate no, or you should allege no, the, the, the factual circumstances no, surrounding the case no, para to support the offense no, sought to be charged. Okay? And lastly, the complaint or information must specify the qualifying and aggravating circumstances of the offense. So, if the offense is uh, ag uh, qualified or aggravated by uh, circumstances, no? So as to upgrade, no? Or to, to impose a higher uh, offense against the accused, you should state or you should specify the qualifying aggravating circumstances. So it is not enough, no? That uh, you allege, no? The, the acts or omissions. I specify po mo dito na uh, I-allege po din mo dito kung sa itong mga qualifying and aggravating circumstances para ma-upgrade ang crime from homicide to murder. Example, um, evident, uh, the, the qualifying circumstance of evident premeditation. So, you should, ano, you should specify, okay, like uh, a plan, no? Uh, several, uh, before he, uh, he committed the crime, Ani yung gibuhat, ana, na plano siya, sa orasa, ana, etc. Ana, ana, ana. So, so, we should uh, specify them. No? Otherwise, you cannot uh, charge the accused no, with a higher offense without the qualifying and aggravating circumstances of the offense. Now, what is the effect no, if there is failure to designate the offense by the statute or failure to mention the provision violated? Will that... Uh, uh, defect uh, invalidate the complaint or information? The answer is no. Okay? In the case of Malto versus people, the failure to designate the offense by the statute or to mention the specific provision penalizing the act or an erroneous specification of the law violated does not vitiate the information if the facts alleged clearly recite the facts constituting the crime charge. Reason, because there is no law which requires that in order that an accused may be convicted, the specific provision which penalizes the act charge be mentioned in the information. So, for example, nagkamali lang nun ng pangalan. Nagkamali ka lang na i-designate yung offense. Ang sabi mo dun sa complaint mo is yung offense na nakumit niya is estafa. Sabi mo dun. So, I am executing this affidavit to charge A 
of estafa under the revised penal code. But upon perusal of the contents of the complaint, the contents of the complaint or the acts or, or omissions uh, complained of do not support the crime of estafa, but instead it supports the crime of qualified theft, for example. So, will, will that defect um, invalidate the complaint? Again, we said earlier, the answer is no. Because there is no law that requires no, that uh, an accused, that in order that an accused may be convicted, no, the specific provision of the law should be mentioned in the information. Okay? For as long as the recital of the facts, no, with respect to the acts or omissions complained of, clear siya dapat, no, nga, it is for qualified theft. So, that is the, the principle. Because again, let's go back to the test of sufficiency. Ano nga ulit yung test of sufficiency? Whether the crime is described in intelligible terms, no, with such particularity, as to apprise the accused. To enable, okay, to enable the accused to suitably prepare for his defense. No? For as long as the accused can understand no, the, the complaint and the charges against him, then the complaint or information is sufficient. Okay? For as long as alam niya kung ano yung uh, pinafile sa kanya na case. No? Because that's the thing lang naman na importante no para sa on the part of the accused kaya kaya tinitest natin kung sufficient ba yung complaint or information effect of failure to specify the correct crime oh, just like what i gave you no as an example yung sa, ang sinabi mo sa complaint is estafa pero yung facts doon will support the crime of qualified theft so even if you have erroneously designated a crime, uh, it will not affect the validity of the complaint or information. For as long as, again, the recital of the facts and circumstances uh, in the complaint is clear no, that the crime committed is qualified theft. Now, for, for again, yung principle no, that uh, if, you wa if the crime is... Uh, qualified no or aggravated by circumstances you should specify no the qualifying and aggravating circumstance otherwise you cannot charge the accused of a higher crime if the qualifying and aggravating circumstances are not alleged in the information or complaint Next, the approximate date of the commission of the offense. So, Section 11 of Rule 110 establishes the general rule that it is not necessary to state the precise date the offense was committed because the offense may be alleged to have been committed on a date as near as possible to the actual date of its commission. Okay, generally, no? hindi required na exact talaga yung date no ng commission of the offense you can uh, if you can notice no sa mga cases de ba ang ginabutang nila is that on or about August 27 or sometime in uh, they use these uh, terms no in in alleging the date of the commission of the offense because under the rules it is not required that you state the exact date of the commission of the offense but by way of exception, if the date is a, an element of the offense, then that's the time that you should state the exact date of the offense. For place of the commission of the offense, 
What is the rule? The statement of the place of commission of an offense is sufficient if it can be understood from the allegations of the complaint or information that the offense was committed or some of its essential elements occurred at some place within the jurisdiction of the court. Okay. Where the particular place where the offense was committed is, however, an essential element of the offense or is necessary for its identification, it is implied from the rule that the description of the place of the commission of the offense must be specific. So the law says that you can just uh, allege no, a general averment no, of the place of the commission of the offense for as long as no, uh, it occurred no, within the jurisdiction of the court. But again, just like the date, if it is an essential element of the offense, then you should state it with such particularity. Uh, remember, no, venue in criminal actions is jurisdictional. So it is very important that you uh, can establish no, in, the, in, the, in the complaint or information the, the place. No? Although, dili ni mo specifically stated, pero at least may identify mo, establish ni mo nga kana siya nga lugar is within the jurisdiction of the court because venue in criminal cases is jurisdictional. As a rule, the criminal action shall be instituted and tried in the court of the municipality or territory where the offense was committed. Okay, kung saan na commit yung offense, ang court na may jurisdiction over that place has jurisdiction over the case. Or where any of its essential ingredients occurred. Okay? This is, however, subject to existing laws, no? such as the, the jurisdiction over cases of written defamation. And you know that already. Remember, no? Section 15, no? Of Rule 110. 110. No? Yung mga... Offenses committed in train, aircraft, or vehicle, or offenses committed on board a vessel. And those offenses covered by Article 2 of the Revised Penal Code. Exceptions din ito to the rule, no? So, just take note of them. Any question? Okay, here. When can you question the insufficiency of the complaint or information? Diba? So, when? Kanusa ni mo pwede i-question no, ang complaint or information based on its sufficiency? The rule says that you should uh, question it before arraignment no before arraignment or during arraignment an accused is deemed to have waived his right if he fails to object upon his arraignment or during trial in either case evidence presented during trial can cure the defect in the information so if you have voluntarily entered a plea when arraigned and you have voluntarily participated in the trial, therefore you can no longer question the insufficiency of the complaint or information. Now, another question. Can you charge two or more offenses in one complaint or information? The answer is generally no. The general rule is that a complaint or an information must charge only one offense. But there are exceptions to the rule, no? Example, yung complex crime. Article 48 no, of the Revised Penal Code. If the crime is a complex crime, then uh, that is allowed. So, hindi siya duplicitous. Kasi, uh, single lang naman yung kanyang punishment no, for 
these uh, complex crimes. Then second exception, compound crimes. Then series of acts, rebellion under Hernandez doctrine and special complex crimes. So these are the exceptions to the rule. But generally, you cannot charge two offenses in one complaint or information. Otherwise, the complaint will be considered duplicitous. And therefore, you can object. No, you can object. File an ob objection no, to the information or complaint on the ground of duplicity of the offense. Okay. So let's go to amendment and the new of criminal actions or substitution of the complaint or information. So with respect to amendment, you can amend the complaint or information before or after arraignment. However, uh, the difference between the two uh, is that if the, if the amendment is before arraignment, generally, there is no leave of court that is required. So you can amend the complaint or information without asking permission from the court. And the amendment there may be in form or in substance. However, by way of exceptions, if the amendment is, has the effect of downgrading you know, the nature of the offense charge, let's say, for example, from murder to homicide, or if it includes any of the accused from the complaint, okay, there are five accused and you will drop one accused, so the rule says that the uh, amendment should be with leave of court, meaning to say you should ask permission from the court before you can amend the information or complaint. Okay, there must be a motion by the prosecutor with notice to the offended party. But if the, the amendment is after arraignment, the amendment should always be with a leave of court, meaning you should always ask permission from the court before you can amend the information. And secondly, the amendment is uh, only for formal amendments. So, wala dapat substantial amendment after arraignment, okay? And the accused is not prejudiced thereby. So even if the amendment is a formal amendment, and if it will result to uh, denial of the rights of the accused, then the amendment cannot be made. So in the case of Ricardo versus Court of Appeals, no, after arraignment, a substantial amendment is proscribed, meaning prohibited, except if the same is beneficial to the accused. No? Except lang daw if the same is beneficial to the accused. Then the amendment can be made, even if the amendment is substantial. So when is an amendment considered formal or substantial? So, Ricardo versus CA, it has been held that the test as to whether a defendant is prejudiced by the amendment is whether a defense under the information as it originally stood would be available after the amendment is made and whether any evidence defendant might have would be equally applicable to the information in the one form as in the other. An amendment on information which does not change the nature of the crime alleged therein does not affect the essence of the offense or cause surprise or deprive the accused of an opportunity to meet the new agreement had each been held to be one of form and not of substance. So remember this uh, test no? in determining whether the amendment is formal or substantial. So what are examples of formal amendments? Substitution of private complainant. 
new allegations which relate only to the range of penalty that the court might impose in the event of conviction. So if it does not change the nature of the offense, okay, the amendment is merely formal. Okay. An amendment which does not cha charge another offense, different or distinct from that charge in the original one. Additional allegations which do not alter the prosecution's theory of the case. An amendment which does not adversely affect any substantial right of the accused. And amendment that merely adds specifications to eliminate vagueness in the information or ano siya ka ng bill of particulars kaya wala na lubat ko Okay, so now you already know no, the examples of formal amendments. So what about substantial amendments? Oh, let me ask you. What if, for example, uh, the amendment is to change the designation of the offense charge? Let us say uh, from homicide to murder. Okay? And the information or the complaint uh, however, does not uh, specify you know, the qualifying and aggravating circumstances. But the prosecutor moved for the amendment of the complaint or information uh, upgrading the, the crime from homicide to murder. Question, is the amendment formal or substantial? So, what is your answer? Formal or substantial? <clears throat> Anyone? Any idea? Is it formal or substantial? Malay mo, ano? Tubag? Hmm? Sige, ako nalay manawag. Uh, Mr. Castardo. In the example given, what do you think? Is it formal or substantial amendment? Nasi Castardo? Yes, attorney na, attorney. Ah, okay. Oh, ang say answer ni mo. Uh, dahil matakog points kung makatama ka the new information is it formal or substantial either formal and substantial Attorney. Hmm? Attorney. what is your answer Okay, I will repeat now the scenario. 
Okay, the complaint is originally uh, for the crime of homicide. Okay, because uh, there is no allegation no, of qualifying and aggravating circumstances. So after arraignment, okay, the prosecutor uh, moved for the amendment of the complaint of the information. And the prosecutor wanted to add allegations on qualifying and aggravating circumstance so as to uh, upgrade no, the crime from, from homicide to murder. Question, is the amendment formal or substantial? It is substantial, attorney. Why? Since it, it affects the nature of the crime, attorney. Why does it affect the nature of the crime? Uh, the additional information, which is the aggravating circumstances, uh, aggravating circumstances with which uh, can the aggravating circumstances up. Which is added information can change the crime into a uh, crime of murder. Okay. Again, what is the rule? What is the rule if if the if the amendment is made after arraignment? What is the rule? Leave a court now. Mm -hmm. Mr. Castardo? Uy, bago na natin i-discuss ba? Kalimot na ka? <laughs> oh, balik pa. Pag after arraignment, it should be with leave of court and only formal amendments are allowed. But in the case or in the, in the given example, the amendment is substantial. Why? Because uh, the... The prosecutor sought to add allegations on qualifying and aggravating circumstances, which, uh, which allegations were not originally stated in the original complaint. So, in that case, uh, the amendment is a substantial one. But in this case of Pakoy versus Judge Afable Kahigal, here the Supreme Court held that. The amendment from homicide to murder is not a substantial one, but merely a formal amendment. Why? Because here in this case, the complaint or information okay, had contained an allegation of the aggravating circumstance of disregard of rank. Meaning to say there was already an allegation in the original complaint. No? of aggravating circumstance. So, the amendment from homicide to murder, even after arraignment, was held by the Supreme Court as merely formal because you are just changing the caption of the complaint and not the allegations in the body of the complaint. Remember that what uh, governs is the recital in the information or complaint, no? the facts and circumstances alleged in the complaint, and not the title or the caption. Uh, let's go to substitution. You know, you know already what is amendment now, substitution of complaint or information. A complaint or information may be substituted. Hala, time na ba? Hala ka. If it appears at any time before judgment, that a mistake has been made in charging the proper offense. In such a case, 
the court shall dismiss the original complaint or information once the new one charging the proper offense is filed, provided the accused will not be placed in double jeopardy. So, for example, you charge the crime of um, let us say kanina, yung sinabi ko no, estafa. Pero the facts no alleged in the complaint supports the crime of qualified theft. Now, uh, notwithstanding the erroneous designation of the offense, the case was filed before the court, meaning the case was filed for estapa. So at any time before judgment, no, if it has become man, if it has become manifested no nga, uh, uh, that the complaint, I that the facts no in the information is for qualified theft, no, or there is error no, in charging the proper offense, then you can move for the substitution of the complaint or the information. So, so under the, under section 19 no, of rule 119, if it becomes manifest at any time before judgment that the accused cannot be convicted of the offense charge or of any other offense necessarily included therein, as when a mistake has been made in charging the proper offense, the, co the court Okay, then the the you know, the fiscal no may move no for the substitution of the complaint or information. So ano mangyayari? The court will dismiss the original complaint once the new one charging the proper offense is filed, provided the accused will not be placed in double jeopardy. So kapag different, entirely different offense yung i charge mo, i change mo. So amendment is not proper. Okay, amendment is not proper. What is proper is the substitution. So let's go to the distinction of between amendment and substitution. So when you say amendment, it may be made, it can be made before or after the defendant pleads guilty or not guilty. But in substitution, may be made before or after the defendant pleads. Oh, same. Same lang kailan no both. Amendment either formal or substantial, but in substitution, only substantial change is allowed. Amendment is maybe with or without leave of court, but with substitution, it is always with leave of court. Amendment, informal amendments, no need for another preliminary investigation and arraignment. So uh, if you have uh, made formal amendments, no? the complaint or information, there is no need to undergo, again, uh, preliminary investigation and arraignment because the amendment is merely formal. But with substantial amendments, it cannot take place after arraignment over the objection of the accused. Otherwise, he can invoke double jeopardy. So, meaning to say, pag ang amendment substantial after arraignment, if the change is substantial no, after arraignment, so, wag mo na lang i-amend. Okay? And if the new crime is different, no, entirely different from the old crime, then uh, ang gawin mo is uh, substitution, hindi amendment. But if the crime is ano lang, uh, necessarily included or necessarily includes the new crime, hindi siya pwede for substitution. Okay? So, substitution there is a need to take another preliminary investigation arraignment. Why? Because you are charging an entirely different offense. So, uh, lastly, double jeopardy is not available as a defense in substitution. Because, what is the reason? Because you are charging an, a different offense which does not include or is not necessarily included in the original charge. And therefore, the accused cannot claim double jeopardy. Okay? 
So we're done with chapter two. Any question?